Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Peruto Making Waves podcast. I'm Jeff Kisleric. And I'm Eric Kunz. And today we have a special episode for you. You know, we're getting into the winter season here. And one of the things that a lot of the U.S. has to deal with is winterizing your boats. Yes. Gets very cold. Yeah. It gets very cold. And so what we've done is we brought in an expert to talk to us today about winterizing your boat. We have Lenny Rudo, who is a, a longtime boating writer. And, uh, and he's kind of the expert in all different fields, but definitely he's in, in Maryland, so he's really familiar with uh, winterizing his boat. So we're gonna to talk to him today about winterizing your boat. But first, we wanna show you today's Furuno featured employee. All right, guys, today's Furuno featured employee is Mr. Kazuki Funo. He is uh, here from uh, Furuno Electric Company in Japan, and he's stationed here for five years. Funo-san, it's nice to see you. Nice to meet you. And uh, so tell us a little bit about, um, you've come from Japan and you're here at Furuno USA, and so you're stationed here for five years? Yes. So this is my second year in the, uh, unless I screw up, I'm going to be, I'm going to have <laughs> a three years more. <laughs> three more years. And, and what do you do here at Furuno USA for us? I'm now global supply chain manager. I'm basically doing a purchasing from headquarters. So I'm buying Furuna products from headquarters. Okay, so you handle all the supply chains. So anything that comes in from Japan goes through you. So we order through you, you contact Furuno Electric in Japan, and then that brings all the products in here that we distribute throughout the US. Yeah. Okay. So. How did you get started at Furuno? What was, you know, were you, did you go to college beforehand, university, and then start at Furuno, or how did that start? Yes, I was a um, university student, 2017, 2018, and after graduating, I found Furuno, because I love fishing oh, in Japan. okay. Yeah. So you knew about Furuno beforehand then? You've heard of Furuno? Uh, no, yet, never. No, really? <laughs> never. But my friend who loves also fishing recommended me to join Furuno. And the, uh, this, you know, Furuno has uh, many distributors around the world. And the, uh, I thought Furuno would be the best company for me because uh, there would be chance for me to station other countries. In Japan, is Furuno a well-known name or is it uh, just in the marine industry that it's well-known? Yeah, in this industry, yes, but, in this industry. Right, yeah. but outside of that, it's, uh, it's, it's not like uh, Toyota or, or Honda, it's uh, more in the marine industry. Yeah, marine industry. Now, Furuno Electric also, even though here in the U.S. we, we deal just with the marine industry, um, Fruno Electric also has some other divisions, correct? Right, yeah, GPS, chip division, medical equipment division, or car electronic, like, yeah, I don't know how to say, ETC. This is to go through gate of a highway. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, like toll, toll gates? Uh, toll gates, yeah, okay. right. All right, and then, so when you started, did you have an opportunity in different divisions as well, or are you in the marine division? In marine division, I insisted to headquarters <laughs> to how can I say to, to be in the uh, international marketing department because yeah uh, uh, I wanna be in the U.S. Uh, okay. <laughs> so speaking of being in the U.S., so so you're here for five years now. Mm -hmm. Did you move your whole family here? Or? Yes, my wife came to the U.S. as well. Yeah. Okay. Great. And so you're here. So five years. What's so you've been here two almost three years, mm -hmm. right? What's your favorite part about living in the U.S.? Um, people, nature, and in Fruno, USA, we have a popcorn party, <laughs> Christmas party, mini party parties, Halloween parties. It's just so fun. Uh, you don't have that at uh, Japan? No. no. It's all business, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we, we enjoy having some social activity here as well. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you this question. What is... What, what do you do outside of work here in the U.S.? What's some of your favorite things that you've done since you've been here in the U.S.? Because I know you've been doing some traveling while yeah. you've been here as well. <laughs> yeah, I love traveling. I went to New York, Nashville, Washington, D.C., Florida, 
uh, wherever, yeah. That's good. Puerto what? Rico, Brazil, yeah. Oh, wow. So what was your favorite place that you've traveled so far since being here in the U.S.? Brazil is the best. Brazil. Sorry, it's not U.S., <laughs> but <laughs> Brazil was the best. Yeah. It was the best, good. What plans do you have for more travels? Yeah, I want to go to Canada, I mean, uh, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, more, yeah. I guess one, one final question for you then is, after your three more years here, mm -hmm. what happens to you when you go back to Japan? I want to, I don't know, but I want to be manager in the other subsidiaries after going back to Japan. Yeah, okay. like, yeah I want to come back to FUSA again as a manager of this company. Oh, <laughs> nice. So what would be if, I know you want to come back to the U.S. and I don't blame you, but what would be another country that you'd want to go to to be a manager for? Uh, European countries. Yeah? Yeah, like UK, Spain, Denmark, yeah. Have you spent time there at all or not yet? Uh, just for tourism. Tourism. Trip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Funo-san, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. All right, <laughs> take care. All right, guys, so here we are. We've got Lenny Ruda. Lenny, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Doing good. Yeah. Doing good. Have you been uh, at the boat shows at all yet this season? Well, fortunately, most of our fall shows are behind us now. And I say fortunately because, man, they're a grind. But it was great to see, you know, in Annapolis, we had tremendous foot traffic, lots of people walking around, looking at boats, looking at gear. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. I heard uh, actually Fort Lauderdale was pretty successful as well. So a lot of foot traffic, a lot of people, a lot of attendees, people buying boats, which is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. The, unfortunately, were you at Fort Lauderdale? I did not make Lauderdale this year. Uh, the, we heard the first day actually flooded. We actually, the our booth had uh, a couple inches of water and actually flooded in there. So I, I think we're all glad we weren't there this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been there. I've been there for floods. It's actually, it's been pretty bad sometimes. So rolling up our sleeves, taking our shoes off and rolling up our, our, our pants and kind of walking home from there right. <laughs> quite a few times in bare feet. Yeah. So Lenny, obviously up in Maryland there, one of the things that you have to deal with is the winter ice for your boat. And that's the topic of our podcast today. So um, we're really looking forward to, to seeing what you do and what your recommendations are for winterizing your boats and I, I, both the boat itself and also the electronics, because that's obviously a piece that we're uh, concerned with, right? Sure. So, cool. you know, it's funny because right now it's 60 degrees out <laughs> <laughs> and it's the craziest thing. Here we are in November, but this is actually when it gets really dangerous for a lot of folks because they think, oh, it's warm out. I don't need to worry about it. The next thing you know, you get a cold night, a hard freeze and something breaks. So it's a good, good topic to do. When we're looking at, at winterizing a boat, um, you know, I mean, we're talking boats of all sizes, all kinds, whether it's a center console, whether it's a cruiser or a sailboat. What's what's the first thing that you recommend or that you start with with, with winterizing a boat? Well, you know, the bottom line item that you got to have in your head at all times is water. Water freezes. It causes freeze damage, right? It expands as it becomes ice. It breaks stuff. If there's water in the bilge, uh, a plumbing line uh, pulled up in the corner of the cockpit, anywhere, anywhere there's water, you've got potential damage. So that's sort of number one. And then number two is, you know, for a lot of people, they lay up their boat for the winter. That boat's not going to get used for months. And, you know, a lot of stuff can go wrong on a boat when you let it sit for months and months. So you got to cover that aspect of things, too. You know, a couple things uh, that come to my mind is I, I grew up in New Jersey, Little Lake Harbor, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, down in Long Beach Island, they used to use bubblers in, in, salt, in the salt water as well to keep the actual hulls from cracking around the boats. If you're going to leave your boat in the water versus pulling it out, put it on a trailer or put it on a dry, it's, uh, it's a different story. So there's different things that you have to consider. Uh, depending on what kind of boat you have and where you're going to winter it. So, uh, but one of the things, of course, is that uh, you know fresh water freezes at zero degrees C or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but salt water actually freezes at about 28 degrees. So uh, you have to be careful, and that's why uh, in in the uh, in the harbor in the marina where uh, I grew up, uh, we used to use bubblers around the hull to keep the uh, the ice from forming uh, in the salt water, and it is a factor. So that's something to consider as well. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because it's actually been, there's been a shift in recent years 
I'm going to say boats 40 feet and under. Um, we have more and more and more lifts. Everywhere you look, people are putting boats on lifts, whereas people used to often winterize in the marina or put it on a trailer and take it home. And some people still do both. Um, nowadays, you actually see a lot of boats get winterized on the lift. So that's kind of introduced a new little bit of a curveball into a lot of what's been going on recently. And is just putting it on a lift enough of winterizing, or is there still a list of things that you need to do? Oh, no. you got to go through the whole rigmarole still. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that it really eliminates any of the other winterization items, perhaps except for, you know, worrying about hull damage if the boat's in the water. i got to say, I'm not a huge fan of in-water winterizing. And I say that because there are a lot of problems. You end up, man, you know, people put light bulbs, they hear... They here put a light bulb in the bilge to keep it warm. And then they do that. And then they light a fire on the boat. You know, stuff like that happens. Um, bubblers can fail. That can be an issue if electricity gets lost during a blizzard, right? And then all of a sudden it's freezing up on the hull. The damage that can take place there is no longer uh, problematic. Now we're talking catastrophic. So, hmm. so it, you know, big boats in particular can be winterized in the water. But I gotta say, I'm not a fan. I'd rather see that boat on dry land where I know it's safe, or up in a lift where I know nothing, you know, horrific is gonna happen. But you also have to consider the fact that you know when you have these lifts and these giant boat barns now all over the place, you don't have the same access to your boat that you would normally in the middle of the winter. You know, you used to be able to walk up to it and work on it or do things to it, but now it takes arguably a little more preparation before the gets, boat gets stacked on these lifts and you really can't really touch it without having to, you know, go in and have the boat brought down to you. So before you put it up there and put it in the rack, you know, 30, 40 feet up, I've seen some of these crazy boat, boat barns now. Uh, it, it's more of a factor to go in and say, hey, let's, uh, let's, you know, let's take care of, make sure there's no water, standing water in the bilges. Of course, the engines or, or the, you know, the heat exchanger cooling systems have to be uh, you know, bled and make sure you don't have any standing water in the system or else, you know, when water freezes, it increases by about 10% in volume, which is the big thing. Most, most other things when they freeze, they shrink, but water is just the opposite. It increases in volume and that's what cracks and breaks things. So you have to consider that and, and factor that into any boat winterization process. So let's kind of start just kind of step by step on what you would do for winterizing your boat. So uh, what size is your boat, Lenny? Uh, which one? Uh, right now I have a 26, a 16, and a 14. <laughs> okay, so so let's let's look at the 26 because that's kind of uh, average average size I would say that that uh, a lot of our uh, users would be looking at or larger. Um, what's the step one of winterizing that boat, and where do you start from? Well, the first thing I mentioned earlier, water. You got to get rid of all the water. Any pretty much, you know, most boats 18 or up are going to have some form of plumbing on them, be it a raw water wash down, fresh water wash down, a head system. Believe me, you want to take care of the head system. You do not want that sucker to freeze and crack. That's like <laughs> we're talking worst case scenario there, right? Because then it melts and you got a big mess. Um, but, you know, all of those types of systems, uh, one that people miss a lot of times is live well pumps, right? Because you might drain the live well, but that pump may have water in it. Well, unless you want to replace it next spring, you got to make sure you run it, run all the water out of there. In some cases, you may need to run any freeze through it. Yeah. And, and that brings up a point that I wanted to make sure that I made today. And that's it. Every boat is different. And the winterization process really can vary quite a bit from boat to boat. I would encourage people to do a lot of research if, they, if they're not familiar with how to winterize their boat. And again, always keep in mind, where's the water? Where's the water? Where do I have to deal with that, right? Now, we can separate this into two buckets. That's one. The other is the power plant. And that's going to be a completely separate issue that, you know, obviously is super duper critical. You really don't want to have to buy a new power plant next year. So you want to make real sure that gets taken care of. And in that case, one thing I want to make sure everybody thinks about is read your owner's manual. Look, I hate reading owner's manuals as much as the next person. I really do. <laughs> right. But this is one case where you just absolutely positively must do it. Um, as was mentioned earlier, you, you've got, you know, you, di different types of inboards with different types of exchangers, cooling systems. Um, 
you know, exhaust systems. They're, they're, every boat is going to be a little bit different, and every power system is going to be a little bit different, particularly when it comes to inboards and stern drives. Outboards are a little easier to deal with, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Uh, but if you have a boat with an inboard of any type or a stern drive, boy, you better read that owner's manual. Yeah, something interesting that you mentioned was uh, the fact that you have to uh, perhaps even add antifreeze to the system. And if it's a water system, potable water, you don't want to add uh, ethylene glycol, the green antifreeze. You want to add propylene glycol, which is orange antifreeze, because propylene glycol is not poisonous. You know, you can actually arguably drink it, but you don't want to. But it, it's uh, <laughs> but ethylene glycol will kill you, you know, or, right. or make you crazy. So you have to make wow. sure you use the right stuff in the right situation. And... If you're going to worry about your potable water or your head or anything like that, you probably want to use the orange antifreeze uh, at, at all times because it's really much, much safer. And it, it's just nothing, nothing you have to consider if you, do, if you use that as well. Or drain the system. But as, you, as Lenny just said, you know, heat exchangers and exhaust systems as well. It's not just enough to drain the engine block on a lot of these uh, boats. You have to drain the exhaust system as well because water will sit, especially in inboards, in the exhaust system and also cause cracks and uh, huge, huge damage of not throwing the whole engine away. So that's a big factor. What What about outboards? What do you do for uh, outboard situation? I got a great tip for you. You know what the best way to winterize an outboard is? Honest to God, use it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best thing you can do for an outboard motor. Now, when an outboard's tilted all the way down, every one of them, they're designed to completely drain them. You right. do not need to run antifreeze through them, although some people do because they figure, well, I better be safe. I've had a lot of outboards through the years, and I've never touched a drop of antifreeze. It's completely unnecessary. Um, however, again, it's got to be tilted full down. That'll get rid of the water. The next issue that you have is uh, internal. You don't want any corrosion to form. You don't want the seals to dry out. They'll shrink. Um, and normally when you run an outboard, let's say every month or so, uh, all that stuff gets lubricated, right? The lubrication gets washed around inside the motor and everything is happy. Uh, if a boat's going to sit for three, four months at a time, you've got to take precautions. There are two ways to handle it. One way is simply to put a pair of earmuffs on it and start it religiously at least once a month. That's what I do personally. Um, I actually don't use fogging oil on my boats because, hey, even though it's Maryland and it gets cold out there, we might have a nice run of rockfish pop up in the middle of January. I don't want to miss it. Right. <laughs> so I actually mark on my calendar the first of every month to go out there and run all my outboards. Um, now, if you want to lay it up, the natural thing to do is to fog it, right? And that gets fogging oil, which protects from corrosion and from drying out, gets it there inside uh, of the motor. And historically, with two strokes, we would spray it into the carb until the motor choked out. That's why it's called fogging it, because it would make a fog. Huh. Uh, what's funny is these days, that's really not even the thing to do. Your modern motors with your uh, fuel injection systems, fogging is just the simplest process. It's really easy. You get some, they still call it fogging oil. You get your manufacturer's recommended brand, get a small remote fuel tank, put in a gallon of gas, put in the recommended amount of fogging oil, hook that up and just run that through the motor. And you'll know when it goes through the motor because you'll start seeing smoke where you normally don't see smoke coming out uh, and you're good to go. You know, as far as electronics go, uh, I'm happy to say that really with Peru, with respect to Peruno, there's really not much you have to do. Maybe wipe everything down. Uh, if there's any exposed metal or anything like that, you might want to, uh, you know, put a little fogging oil on maybe some of the back connectors or something like that, that uh, if you have an older system, especially, but the modern, uh, you know, TZ Touch and even our deep sea products really don't have to do much. Now, of course, for Arctic conditions, Bruno is a big supplier of deep sea equipment, uh, icebreakers. They have neck heaters on the radars and things like that to keep them from freezing, but mostly for operation. And when you're in super, you know, super icy weather in, uh, you know, in Alaska or something like that, that's where we sell some uh, equip some of our equipment is actually equipped with neck heaters for, for radars because the uh, the ice can form even salt uh, salt water ice is a, a big factor for those guys because it's so cold uh, that they have neck heaters on the radars but for the normal 
uh, customer in the 48 and the lower 48, you really don't have to worry too much about that. And uh, the Bruno products, all of our electronics are designed to operate from basically, I think, like minus 10 or minus uh, 10 uh, Celsius, which is like minus, you know, pr pretty cold, all the way up to, uh, you know, 55 C sometimes. So it's really not a problem. And, uh, and, and there isn't much to do with respect to Peruno equipment in the winter or with respect to winterization. Is there, is there any maintenance that can be done uh, during the winterizing of like the radar antennas or the GPS antennas or anything that, that helps? Or Not really the modern equipment, the, the modern uh, you know, DRS and, uh, and uh, you know, NXT radars really no. Especially the NXT radars, which is really cool. They're solid state, so there's no big uh, startup process. Now with magnetron radars, which we still sell a lot of, you know, which is still a factor. Uh, they do actually have temperature sensors in the arrays sometimes or in the uh, gearbox that actually change the startup time to a longer startup time if they sense that it's really cold weather because the magnetron is almost like a light bulb in a way. It's like a vacuum tube. It is a vacuum tube in a sense, and it does take longer to warm up in colder weather. But with the modern NXT solid state transmitters that are so popular these days and for a million reasons, they're really great in a lot of ways. Uh, they don't really require a lot of startup time. They're still instant on, and they're designed to be started in cold weather, so that's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You know, while I've got you guys on the screen here, I got a question about electronics and winter that I've never gotten the satisfactory answer. Can I, can I hit you? You bet. Yeah, so, absolutely. So here's the deal. Let's say you've got your boat fully covered under your winter cover. So it's protected, not, you know, water's not going to get in. Should you leave the cover on the LCD, the secondary cover, should you leave that on like your average center console? Um, I, you know, I know from experience, the stuff you guys build is pretty darn bulletproof, but I pulled that cover off in the past and found moisture under it. And it made me wonder. Do I want to risk trapping moisture against the LCD screen, or should that come off? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I think uh, you know, in 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 many cases with the uh, modern LCDs and the way we're actually enclosing these uh, these displays, it's not a problem anymore. You know, in the past, absolutely, you know, it was an issue. You would get you know uh, debris, uh, either in moisture or condensation, and it would wick its way underneath the uh, the LCD. In fact, I remember uh, Jim Ratteridge taught me when I first started here over 30 years ago to actually take a, uh, a business card and go around the the, uh, the the displays of different products and see, hey, can you wedge a business card in there? Will water get in? Will moisture wick itself in or condensation? And uh, the way Back the products, it. yeah, behind it, yeah, and actually cause problems. Uh, these days, it's not really an issue. I mean, if you have, yeah, if you do have older equipment and uh, Bruno's famous for uh, being able to service and uh, and keep uh, keep these older products going, uh, then it could be a factor. But with any modern product sold in the past 10 years or so, it's really and especially if we say waterproof to you know CFR 46, you know where you actually hose the thing down. Uh, you know you don't want to use high pressure water when you're cleaning these products, and because it could you know high pressure could still work its way in there. But for 99% of the time, uh, you know just wiping the product down, putting the cover on, and let it go. I'd be more worried personally of, uh, you know, some kind of weird thing happening where, uh, you know, snow would cave in the display or fall on the display, and that's where the cover would actually protect it more than worry about condensation or, or water wicking in. So that's that's my answer anyway. And uh, cool, you know, right. if anybody wants to, by the way, we're welcome. Uh, I'm welcome to be criticized with comments or anything like that. If you guys have personal experience out there and you want to make some comments on, uh, you know, on this podcast, then by all means, uh, let us know. But for the most part, it's not a, and not an issue anymore. And if you guys do have any questions, make sure in the live chat here, you can go ahead and ask questions in there. We have people that are answering or in the comments, uh, put something in the comments and we'll get back to you later on that. So, um, but another question that I have is uh, actually, ironically, just got an email from Airmar yesterday that uh, was talking about winterizing. So it was, uh, it was timely. 
And one of the things that they said is to, when you pull the boat out, to also look at your transducer and because there might be some fouling or growth that happens on a transducer. But is there anything that you do, Lenny, that uh, winterizes the transducer or gets it ready even for the next season? Well, the transducer itself shouldn't be real tough to deal with. That's a completely encased unit. Uh, you really shouldn't be worrying about any problems there. But as they mentioned, you want to clean off growth, and that's a great segue into another big part of winterizing, and that's simply going through your whole boat. Yeah, you want to check it Don't thoroughly. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's just it's a great time to take the opportunity. Maybe it's been you know it's been a busy boating season. Maybe you haven't gone around and tightened all the screws and you know made sure all the nuts and bolts are perfect. And uh, it's this is the time to really go through and find everything that might go wrong come spring now's the time to find it because hey you're gonna have to take some time to get it fixed you want to get it fixed during the winter when you can't use a boat anyway right exactly exactly i will say this with respect to growth on transducers you know growth uh is in fact you know uh biological material which actually does hold air if you have a lot of growth on the transducer it will absolutely reduce the performance so as lenny just said go through and make sure that the transducer face is clean and there's a different there's different ways to do that. Uh, you know, mostly just kind of a, making sure that it's if you if you keep up with it and you and you maintain it, just wiping it down is usually all you need. Uh, and you know, you don't want to get too aggressive with the scrubby pad, but there are anti fouling paints that Airmar supplies and other manufacturers supply that you can apply uh, before you put your boat into uh, into storage for the winter. So that's a that's a great idea, and it's a great thing to do as, on an annual basis that will you know improve the performance. Uh, allow you to get better, uh, at, especially at speed performance or in deeper water where you really need it and you want to see fish or you want to see structure. Um, it's a great idea to make sure that the transducer faces are clean and they're uh, and they're basically you know there's no barnacles or any kind of growth on them because you don't want any turbulence going across the transducer face. That's, that's the other that's thing that can happen. Be... Yeah, of course the turbulence if it starts before the transducer uh, because there is growth on the hull. Uh, and induces uh, turbulence or bubbles. Uh, that's one of the, the things that will kill a transducer every time or kill the perform, not, not the transducer, but the performance of the transducer and the overall system performance is any kind of turbulence or air that passes over the top of the transducer. The, trans the sound energy just does not transmit through air very well or turbulence. So you wanna make sure it's clean and your hull is clean, which will improve, uh, effectively improve the transducer performance and your system performance. This is a, probably a good transition then, because you mentioned about the, the growth on the hull as, as well as the transducer. So Lenny, what do you do for the hull itself to prepare that or winterize that? Well, you know, most of the time these days, the hull's a no-brainer. Um, you know, many boats are kept in lifts or trailers. They're fine. It's time to inspect the paint, see if you're going to need a new paint job next year, if you keep your boat in the water. But this is also a time when you want to clean that hull. You want to clean it good because if you leave those water stains on through the winter and the spring, you're going to have a really tough time getting them off if you can get them off. And that goes for the entire boat, not just the hull. This is also a time for a big cleaning, right? This is, you know, as, as you go through the boat and make your list of all the maintenance items that you're going to need to take care of, get out that scrub brush. Get ready. Give it the big scrub. After you do that, and this is really important, and I know everyone's going to be like, oh, no, 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 no. this is really important. After you clean it, give it a good thick coat of paste wax. It's kind of painful because it's going to be, you know, it might be sitting there for weeks or months before you get to use it again. But if you don't give it that coat of paste wax, after you scrub it down, that gel coat is going to start to oxidize. And it will not look as good two, three, five years in the future. Uh, you, there, there will be a major league difference in how your boat shines or does not shine. So, you know, my own personal practice, every, every fall when I pull the boat and I kind of uh, transition into winter mode, I will give it a full-blown wax job, stem to stern, top and bottom. And then uh, in the springtime, painful as it is, even if I've only used the boat a couple times in the winter, I'll do the whole darn thing again. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the key is too. You don't have to go too crazy. Once you get that wax coating on there, you know, if you don't really care if the boat's in the barn or if it's laid up, and you really don't care how it looks, you really don't have to do like a spit shine or anything like that. Back when I was younger, 
guys used to drive around with waxed cars, you know, where they just put the wax on and really didn't care to wipe it off because you'd wipe it off eventually, but you'd actually drive around like that. See, all the cars are just coated with like wax that wasn't really wiped down. I think that's fine to do on a boat, you know, for a winterization. And then when it comes out, then you wipe it down and maybe give it another final coat and uh, it's good to go for the spring and, 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 your, and your boating season. So uh, it, it's just a great idea to keep the oxidation down, keep the air off the system. And, uh, you know, it, I would totally do it. Uh, I recommend doing that for any painted surface, basically, you know, any paint, any hard painted surface for our products that are, that are uh, just plastic and, and the, the, the actual colors embedded into the plastic, not such a big problem. Just wipe it down a little bit. Don't put wax on it, um, but just make sure it's clean and ready to go for the winter. But for painted surfaces, absolutely, especially something that could oxidize like the gel coat on your boat. I, I think, you know, t talking about electronics too, I think the winter icing, this is a great time to also take the opportunity to back up your system, back up your settings, back up your waypoints, back up your routes and, and your tracks everything and then you have a saved version of For everything sure. yeah. that you have on your system rather than and then at the spring when you bring it out you know hopefully everything is still there and, yeah. and working fine but you have that backup now of your yeah. system well a great point and the great thing about tz touch 3 and tz touch xl and a lot of our other products now is that once you dial it into the cloud and you have you know you have the the, uh, the app on the phone or you know tz i vote or anything like that once you have an account, you have automatic backup. You know, once you log in, it's autom your waypoints and all your personal data is automatically stored in the cloud. So once you have that done and you have your account set up, you log in, you log into the system, boom, it's saved for the winter, saved forever. You know, point. you don't have yeah. to worry about it. PBG data as well, you know, a lot of that's saved now automatically, so you really don't have to worry about it too much. So uh, it's a great, it's a great idea to basically use that account, use our apps. That, uh, that will automatically back up your waypoints and then, then then you're done. You really don't have to worry. And you can log in and check it and edit all that stuff and even route plan in the middle of the winter and log in when you go back to your boat and boom, all that work you've done over the winter while you're sitting there with the snows on the ground, you can say, hey, I want to do the Great Loop. I want to kind of plan some routes in the, in the, in, you know, for the spring or plan some new fishing spots. You can go ahead and search all those analyze those especially with the tz maps new feature for xl really nice that bath amazing bathymetric data that we have uh and go ahead plan that and boom once you log back into your boat in the in the spring all that will be sucked right into the machines and you're good to go oh, yeah. awesome. so it's a really automatic process now and another issue uh, is the boat's battery system you know you want to make sure that your breakers are off uh, if you have a charger you need to trickle charge most batteries throughout the winter uh, interestingly uh, lithium ion batteries, which some people are using, have a much, much lower self discharge rate than a typical lead acid battery. So a lot of times on a lithium ion battery, you don't have to worry about it over the winter so much because they're mm -hmm. like one tenth of the dis self discharge rate. Lead acid batteries will self discharge over time. That's why you trickle charge them. But uh, for winter with those new with these new batteries, sometimes you don't have to worry about it. But uh, it's kind of rare. They're still kind of expensive. But make sure your breakers are off. Make sure there's no current draw from anything on the boat. No pumps are going to turn on by accident in case you know water freezes. It might it might increase the, a float switch or something like that if you haven't really uh, makes sense. You know, winterized everything perfectly. So just uh, isolate your batteries. Uh, put them on a trickle charger and just let them go, and uh, that's the most important, one of the most important things uh, on your boat to make sure that you don't let your batteries drain down over the winter. Because once a battery drains, it's easy for it to freeze, and that is a problem, and it will destroy the battery. So just make sure your boat, your your batteries are isolated and trickle charged over the winter, and uh, and that is a, a good way to make sure that your 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 spring is going to be a lot less hassle without having to buy new batteries for the yeah. boat. Yeah. All right. Well, Lenny, have, is there anything else that we've left out or that you can think of for the winterizing of a boat? Hmm. I think we hit on all the main points. I guess the one thing we haven't really talked about is covering your boat, which can be a critical thing. If you're not going to use it at all for an extended period of time, shrink wrap works pretty darn well. I would encourage people to have a pro do it. I don't encourage people to try and get a shrink wrap kit and do it themselves. That heat gun makes a lot of heat. You can cause a lot of damage if you don't know what you're doing or start a fire. 
Um, so I would have a pro do it. And I would also suggest that if you plan on getting in the boat at all through the winter, have one of those doors put in. You generally get charged extra for it. But otherwise, you really can't access the boat. And, you know, you may want to get in there and fix something or play around with something. Maybe you want to put in some new electronics. I don't know. But <laughs> if that boat is shrink wrapped up tight and sealed, you really can't get in there. Um, another really nice option is to have a full custom cover, um, you know, full custom canvas cover. They're great. I have one for my boat. It only takes me about three hours to put on and take off because those <laughs> winter covers, man, they're easy to deal with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you do want to keep the boat covered and you need to make sure it's sufficient to deal with snowfall. It needs to be uh, vented sufficiently. If you have a cover that doesn't vent, you'll have mold and mildew issues down the road. Right. Um, but that's really, I guess, you know, the final piece for most boats for most boaters. Yeah, make sure it's secure. I know uh, about three years ago, I, I have a ski boat at home that we bring around to the lakes and on the Columbia River. And uh, I, I told my kids, put it on and make sure the wraps go all the way around because we get a lot of wind here in the winter, sometimes storms. And uh, I looked out and uh, I was drinking some coffee. I looked out in the yard. And of course, the cover is on the other <laughs> side of the yard, right? And I go, oh, my God, I never checked the kids did it. So they did it kind of half, you know, half baked. And uh, I didn't look at it, but make sure that cover's secure because when the wind picks up, that's like a giant sail. And if wind can pick up and lift up one edge of it, it really can rip create it. a lot of force and rip it right off. So wow. yeah, not only that, what's worse is some covers, especially sometimes people just use those blue tarps, which is not a great idea. They don't last incredibly well. They don't work incredibly well, but they're uh, they have a textured surface. And if it's tied up, like you're saying, where it's loose and the wind shuffles it back and forth, It'll it, it. it will sand the finish off <laughs> of your boat, your outboard, whatever. Yeah. Especially if you live in a windy area where uh, you can get a lot of wind fluctuations. And, and you, if you look out and you see a tarp flapping and it's beating against something, guaranteed it's scratching it and it's going to cause damage. So that make sure a custom cover and making sure it's perfectly secured is the way to go. Well, Lenny, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, you've given us some great insight on winterizing a boat. And uh, and we may tap it and you, into you again for when you bring your boat out of the, the winterizing and get yeah. it ready for the new season. Yeah, thanks, Lenny. Not a problem. All right. All right. Pleasure. We'll Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> right. You bet. Anytime. It, again, everybody, we appreciate you watching. If you enjoy this episode, make sure you like it. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, feel free to put it in the comments section and we will answer your questions. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time on Perunos Making Waves. <laughs>